Um, so she said she'd want to be able to see the recording. And sometimes Sharishma, uh, who hasn't been able to join us a lot lately, uh, has liked to see the recording. Also for Sharishma, we'll keep her in prayer. Like one of the things with her, uh, her youngest daughter, the one that has the ADD, ADHD, um, Farisha, Apparently, her school clothes, the one that was taking care of her oh, special no. needs. Oh, did it really? Yeah. So oh. she's finally been able to find another school, apparently, and she feels this one's better for her wow. daughter. So, and these are types of things that have been keeping her kind of busy, and she hasn't been able to join in with us. So I'm glad to see that, you know, things are working out, that God's working in her life. Uh, we'll be caring for Sherry and her needs today because i mean she's struggling with depression and some things because of family issues it seems like family issues are always at the top right we always have those things yeah. going on. And they never go away it, it's life <laughs> it's life that's what it comes down to yeah and uh oh and i meant to say hello aaron how you doing brother hi aaron hi everyone yeah, I got to listen to some of your stories. Very interesting. I'm a little, <laughs> little, little, fr not a little, I'm extremely frightened and worried that Lily at this private school in Indiana will be indoctrinated into, as you know, could be turned out bad. Uh, yeah. Prayer. No bueno. Prayer. Prayer. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So yeah. while she's home, I'm constantly talking to her about it, but she's getting angry with me that I'm talking to her about it so much yeah mm -hmm. i'll tell you you know we definitely have to pray that god will give her wisdom and what things to push away you know that yeah. are thrown at her in those type of uh you know academic establishments so well part of the reason why i'm pushing her because i know her and some and her acquaintances that she normally are friends with they're leaders in their classes uh, oh. it'll make a huge difference but yeah they're leading the group um so mm -hmm. unfortunately the sorority that she's in a lot of them are christians and so i think that'll be good for her to be around a lot of other like minded people right mm -hmm. right the power of prayer my mom yeah, prayed for me till the day she died and if it wouldn't have been for that mm, it kept drawing me right back to the lord each time so that's, that's why i know i can't give up on my kids especially rachel the one that's turned away i'm like nope my mama prayed for me i keep praying for rachel <laughs> yeah, i think that's all we can do and i, I have other mm -hmm. parents tell me that that's all they did and eventually sometimes it, it they come back hopefully they all yeah. do the prodigal back in the son day story when, yeah. Back in the day when Ted was in the Navy, we didn't have Wi-Fi or anything. So he'd be gone. And so my mom had to have a lot of faith and prayer. Lord, take care of Ted. Take care of Ted. And the Lord always brought Ted back. And I just, I'm thinking about how powerful her prayer, prayers, you know, were that she couldn't talk to him. She couldn't communicate and just had to trust the Lord that he was taking care of Ted. So... To me, that was a beautiful testimony. It is. Okay. Well, then let's pray and uh, yes. we'll jump right in. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you are here with us and that you give us an opportunity to come together as the body of Christ to study your word. Mm -hmm. I ask your Holy Spirit that you would give us insight and understanding as we study and that you would just make everything clear to us and yes, that yes. each of us would be able to walk away, not just being more intellectually, theologically savvy, but that yes. we would be more like Jesus and that we would live more like Jesus and reflect yes. him in everything yes. we do because of what we learned today. Lord, yes. we look to you and we ask you to give us understanding as we yes. study yes. too. We thank you and we praise you and ask your Holy Spirit that you would just, you know, reveal yourself in a powerful way to us today and that you, Lord God, get all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Let's go ahead and look. First of all, we've already done the first part of Hebrews chapter 6, where we were talking, like I said last week, about how 
that part of scripture is used by several of the denominations that love to say that you can lose your salvation. But as we discussed last week, we found that that's not the case at all. It's easy to try to just snag out a piece of scripture and make it sound like that's what it's saying. But when you actually study the Bible in context and you look at what it's really saying, you find it's not really, uh, you know, it's not what those people have tended to make it say. And I think the reason, just Ted's opinion, but I think the reason people love to say we can lose our salvation is because that's a human thing. It's not a spiritual thing. See, it doesn't show God's love. It shows human weaknesses. We, we as humans tend to understand that somebody can do something to us, egregious, let's say, and it's enough for us to lose relationship with that person. And then somehow they've got to make it up to us if they want to try to come back into our good graces. Well, they try to transpose our fallen way of understanding relationships into such a way that they're transposing it to God and saying, God thinks like we do. But see, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say God has to think like we do. The Bible says we have to be transformed to think like God does. And that's where I think a lot of times people tend to fall off the wagon when they start trying to make God be the one that needs to adjust to the way we think instead of us adjusting to the way God thinks and the way God has mandated and shown his love to us. But the reality is, is that when we conform to God and his image, what we find, we'll have a much more peaceful life, we'll have a much more blessed life, and we'll be more functional in our walk in a, in a godly way than what it will ever get if we just follow the routine of our human walk. Because we've got so many problems in the human walk, whether it's relational, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, uh, I guess, ego building, whatever it is. Pride is always a big one. That's problematic. Those things need to be put away so that we can then reflect and give God the honor and the glory through it all. So as we look on, now we're moving out of that part of the scripture where he was talking about, you know, the issue of how we are to develop in the Lord and how we are to persevere in our walk with him. And we're picking up in verse 13, where it talks about the matter of what we inherit in the promise. Now, remember, as I've said before, he's talking to Jews, so he's using a Jewish premise as background. In this case, Abraham, for those that remember back in Genesis, Abraham, around chapters 12 through 15, Abraham received a covenant promise from God. Not only was he to be the father of many nations, but he was the one to bring God's blessing to a people group. And in this case, it would be the Jews. And we saw that because his son, Isaac, was born, right? And then Isaac had other children, right? Isaac had Jacob, and then Jacob had the 12 patriarchs, right? So we see that God fulfilled his promise to Abraham just at the beginning there. But God said that he would be the father of many nations. Well, guess what? Ishmael was his son. And out of Ishmael, God even provided a promise also that he would have 12 princes, right? And so he also, Ishmael became a big nation. And as a matter of fact, we see that that conflict between the Jews and the Arabs continues today, where the Arabs say, no, Abraham's my father. And the Jews, no, he's my father. And, you know, it's, uh, there's that conflict issue going on. Abraham is both of their fathers. But the chosen line came through Isaac. And so through Isaac, then, is where Jesus came, right? I mean, we see that Jesus came from Abraham. 
and down through the patriarchs, and he would be a son of David. And so he did. He was, you know, Jesus came from the line of the Davidic kinghood. So as we see these things, that's why the writer of Hebrews is taking them back to look at this matter of Abraham. In verse 13, he says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. And he said, I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply you, uh, and carry that out, right? Genesis 2, 20, 22, 17. And so that's, he had already promised Abraham what he was going to do. And the thing about Abraham, well, back before he was renamed Abraham, Abram, God, I mean, Abram, and he stepped out in faith. When God told him to do something, he did it. He didn't question it. He just went and did it. Abraham was a, a guy with a, a really meek kind of character. And so he just went and did it. So he says, now, after God had said that in verse 15, he says, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. And how, didn't that take a long time? It took Abraham a long time to receive that promised child, didn't it? Because that's why he and Sarah forced the issue, and that's why they ended up having Ishmael. So, but it took a while, because look, wasn't Abraham like really old, over 100, and Sarah was like 90 when they finally had Isaac? So he says, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and for them, a confirming oath ends every dispute. In other words, this was an oath coming from God because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise. He guaranteed it with an oath so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. So God established the covenant. God established what was to come. And that in and through Abraham, there was supposed to be more growth. And as a matter of fact, God had Abraham look to the sky and said, can you number the stars? Uh, Abraham obviously said, no, nah, no way. But he said, your progeny are going to be more numerous than the, you know, that. It was a hyperbole statement that says, hey, I'm going to multiply you greatly through this people. You're going to be that father that's going to bring my name to the world. That's what it was supposed to be. Okay, God had a plan. It wasn't just that Abraham have a whole bunch of people, have a whole bunch of family. That wasn't God's purpose. God's purpose through it all was for him to have a people that were going to represent him. Now, regrettably, even though that was the whole reason for the Jewish nation, they didn't do a very good job of representing God, did they? As a matter of fact, they kept trying to bring in other gods. And even after Moses's time frame, and they were told not to have any other gods before him, well, that one sure didn't work very well. They had every nation they met, they wanted their gods. And they would take them. And they would end up using them, you know, to their chagrin, because that was never God's plan, but yet they did it. So we see God's purpose is to be carried out, right? And so he says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul that God is going to be the one for us, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. So now he's referring back to the temple, back when they had the Holy of Holies, where God resided with his people. But yet, look at the comparison now. That's where God resided before Jesus died on the cross. That God lived with his people in the temple. But now, Jesus has entered there on our behalf. In other words, he, Jesus has taken up that position. And now he is the representation of God for all people. And the Father has given him that authority. If you go back to Matthew 28, by around verse 16, where he talks about the whole issue of transferring his power. He says, Jesus said, all authority 
in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So the Father has bestowed all that on the Son. So the Father, who was the one who was leading the Jewish nation, he was Jehovah, Yahweh, now has transferred that responsibility to his Son, Jesus, who now is for all humanity, not just for the Jews anymore. All his power has been transferred to Jesus. And that's why he's saying Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus, in receiving this authority and this power from the Father, who has transferred it to him, basically delegated this authority to him, now he has become our high priest. And you say, well, why is he high priest? Well, what Jesus did, remember when Jesus ascended to heaven, that he was going in his ascension, the reason he ascended, he was going to sit at the right hand of the Father, and he was going to intercede for all believers. And so he sits there interceding for you and me who have received Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so when we do anything that is contrary to how we should be living, Jesus said, uh, Ted really messed up bad, but I died for him. I paid the price. And so he intercedes for me before the Father. And that's why I, Ted, as we read earlier in Hebrews, can go boldly before the throne of God with any requests and with any issues to him because Jesus already paid the price and the Father sees me as righteous. Because it's not my righteousness that he sees. He sees Christ's righteousness. And that's because of what Jesus did. And that's how Jesus fulfills that role of reflecting his righteousness for me, Ted, or for anybody else that has accepted and by sitting at the right hand because God already said that he was pleased with what Jesus had done on the cross, that that was acceptable sacrifice to be able to address the whole problem of sin, the problems that we as humans have that are contrary to what God wants us to do, that Jesus paid the price for it all. So that's the role that Jesus plays as priest for all of us up there in heaven. Now, Jesus has three roles. He's not only priest, but he's also prophet, and he's also king of the line of David, right? And he is the final fulfillment of that, that kingship. So he carries out that kingship because he will come back and he will rule again here on earth. Now, it's not going to be that, that graceful, merciful, peaceful rule in the sense that we expect that he'll come back just like he did when he was here on earth for the 30 years that he was here, 32 years. But it's going to be a just rule. In other words, it's a no-nonsense rule. In other words, people have to conform to what he says and the rules that are applied by his kingship at that time when he comes back and rules here on earth. Now, that's before the millennium is over, okay? So when that, when that happens, then there's, that's the end of time. All of the, all of, uh, in accordance with 2 Peter chapter 3, all of creation at that point will be done away with, and a new heaven and a new earth will come about. At that point, then we who are in Christ Jesus, his children, that will be with him forever and ever, and we will, you know, it'll be a wonderful place. It'll be back to what God had intended back at the Garden of Eden, the type of relationship between we, his children, and he, our God, and we will live and be with him forever and ever and rule with him. Apparently, there will be more creation. God is a creating God. We'll be given jobs to do, and it'll be enjoyable to represent our Lord and God in that, that new kingdom that we will all live in. And that's to come. So that's what the writer of Hebrews is alluding to here as he's coming into this priesthood. Now, I, I remember Aaron, last time we talked about Melchizedek, was wondering about Melchizedek. <laughs> well, 
Melchizedek is a godly priesthood. It's not a human priesthood. It's a godly priesthood. Melchizedek, I don't know where that name comes from, to be honest with you. I don't know how that name come about. I just know that it was used all the way back in Genesis 14. And that was the point in time when Abraham went and rescued Lot, who had been sequestered by some kings that had overrun Sodom and taken him and his family away. Well, when Abraham heard, he took his servants, went and fought against these kings, rescued his son or his nephew, that's who he was, and then brought them all back and whatnot. So, but when he brought them back, the what we see is that Melchizedek showed up to him. And in that, Abraham offered sacrifice, the lesser to the higher, okay? So in other words, he offered sacrifice and gave him a tenth. So the issue is, that's where we see the roots of Melchizedek showing up. And it says that Melchizedek came from Salem, which means peace in the Ugaritic. And uh, that's where the name Jerusalem came from, or city of peace. So when you look at it like that, you realize apparently God in, in Melchizedek already had some type of residence in Salem, the city of peace. I don't understand that one all the way, but I, I remember writing a paper for it in seminary, but, uh, but that kind of showed that God's, I mean, Jerusalem has been like his place from way, way back. And so like he's already, he had selected that even before the time that we seem to give credit, like when David finally was able to overrun Jerusalem and took it in as the city of Zion. You know what I mean? So that, obviously is what the roots of it in terms of what we understand go all the way back to that time at least with abraham maybe even before that in terms of where melchizedek comes from but melchizedek has always been associated with a godly representation whether it was melchizedek showing himself to abraham when abraham had beat those those kings that had come against sodom or whether it is now representing Jesus Christ as the most high priest that there is, that is the label that is applied to that position and that godly position. And that comes over the order of Melchizedek. If anyone has any information more than that, hey, feel free to jump in and uh, and give, give some enlightenment. That yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I have some teaching. I think uh, it was last week. The okay. Mal Melchizedek uh, is also the theophany of Christ. Oh. Uh, yeah. Because huh. even 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 if you if you read seven, there it says uh, priest of God Most High. Right. Right. Oh, good point. I, I mean, I've what never is heard theophany. Theophany, the triunity oh, yeah. of the Godhead: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't put it past that because, I mean, it is definitely a godly title. Okay. And God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in this case, he's representing that priest, high, that most high priesthood, right? So, yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Mil yeah. And, thank and you for that, yeah, Mark. We, yeah. And the comparison okay. is that we have to understand that. You know, Christ is is is, is the high priest. He Amen. especially as you mentioned in the whole uh, verse prior to that. Right. Uh, he, his job is as as a priest is to intercede for us. That's, That's why right. when we come when we come in the presence of God, I don't come in, in, in my name because who am I? Who are you? We come in the name of Most High Christ, Amen. who's our who is our priest. Amen. So therefore, we we could enter into His presence, like That's as you beautiful. know, in the in the uh, in the Old Testament, the high priest was able to go in the holy to holy once a year. Once a year. And if he had a sin, you know what happened, right? Yeah, he got, was extinguished. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No. Amen. Hey, well, very well put, Martin. You said it better than yeah. I did. And I also heard Ted that yeah. it was a uh, pre-incarnate. Um, 
which is called a manifestation of Christ. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. No, you're That's right, what Donna. It was and, and, and go, it just goes along with what, um, who, what was it, Martin said? Yeah, Martin. Uh huh. Okay. What Martin said that um, the high priest, it was him and his pre incarnate where he appeared as the you know, priest. Amen. High priest. And um, the thing that's really kind of amazing about it is that Abraham gave him a tithe. And so a lot of Christians say, oh, the tithe is part of the law. Well, this was before the law. Yes. So, you know, we want to just a little side note. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, both of you have really said exactly what it fits into here. And I'll, I'll tell you. It is all about the fact that we can't really be of any value coming to the Father without Jesus in place, right? Our very high Amen. priest who intercedes, as Martin indicated, for us because it's only through his intercession that we have access. And it's because we are his children. We're adopted into the family of God when we come into salvation because that we have that right. We are co-heirs, as it says in Romans 8, with Jesus Christ. So... That brings us into a great standing. And hey, we shouldn't minimize that. And God has provided every means for us to be able to take advantage of it through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the beauty of it. So as Martin said, look at what it says right there at the beginning of chapter seven. He says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's what I was talking about back in Genesis 14, priest of God Most High, and it falls into exactly what uh, Martin was talking about, you know, the theophany, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Okay, now somebody that is of no notable significance would never be getting a tenth of anything from anybody, okay? So to Abraham, this person was clearly quite superior and he recognized him well if you remember too when the three visitors that came to abram he recognized them right as being godly and two of them were angels one of them was like donna was saying the uh, a manifestation of the pre-incarnate christ so in other words who we would see today is jesus the son so he says first his name means king of righteousness. So that's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So we see that the title brings with it the attributes of God. I mean, that's significant. And we need to look at that because it is what Jesus did for us that gives the authority and the blessings that we receive because of what he's done. I mean, man, without that, we'd be up, a, we'd be in deep weeds. All of us would be going to hell. We'd have no cho one chance whatsoever. But now we do because of our most high priest. He says, now he's explaining here about Melchizedek. He says, without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So, he obviously, if God has existed, he is yesterday, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You can understand what he's talking about here. He was never begotten, not in the sense, the human sense, right? God's always been. So he has no genealogy that he came from, per se. Now, they're not talking about Jesus born into the earth. They're talking about the Son of God, okay? In other words, eternal, not, not somebody that you can track, like during the period that God manifested himself on earth to be the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice. He's talking about what he came, what God, or I mean, where Jesus came from. And so he doesn't have a father. The Godhead. Yeah, exactly. The second member of the Godhead. That's right. He, so he doesn't have a father in a human sense. But we know that in the Godhead, he, the father is part of. But that's not 
the same thing that he's talking about. He doesn't have mother in the mother sense or genealogy. In other words, is there a line that somehow you can track back from where God came from? No, there is none. So he's, he's not, doesn't have a beginning in the sense of us who we can say, okay, we do, because we usually go by what? Our birth what? When's our beginning of days? The day we're born. That's right. Yeah. So our birth date, right? So oh, in other okay. words, Jesus doesn't have a birthday in that sense of the word as the son of God, nor end of life. We do, right? When we have an epitaph or, or a tombstone put over our grave, we had an end of life, right? But God doesn't have that. But resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So Jesus is the Son of God, and he fulfills that place as Melchizedek, okay? And so that is who he is and the position he represents for us before the Father our heavenly father. So any questions? I mean, does that clear up Melchizedek in that sense, in terms of how he plays the role, what has happened and what Melchizedek was as we understood him to be back in Genesis 14 as to who he is now that Jesus has died and given his life for everybody and the role he performs for us today. I would just say that, you know, again, uh, uh, Melchizedek, it was a type of Christ. Uh, it was pointed to a shadow that was, that was going to come. You know, it was pointed that's to right. Christ. That's right. That's, yeah. that's ex exactly what he was. He's a type. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That was it. And, and when God said uh, he made a promise to Abraham that, uh, to, to uh, ascertain his promise that he said he made it all he couldn't swear someone uh, above him. He swore by himself. Amen. You know, I, it, the promise that God has made, I and mean, we could trust his, the Bible because Amen. God's guaranteeing what he wrote there. He's going he's to fulfill his promise. And, and the same way as you know that we have the Holy Spirit as a deposit. You know, I mean, real estate. When you buy a house, you, have, you, have, you put a deposit, right? So Christ <laughs> has given us a deposit, which is Holy, the Holy Spirit. And, and God there, uh, you know, uh, made a promise he, he, he swore on himself that the promise is going to be fulfilled to Abraham. So we could, we could trust our Bible. Amen. And that makes it clear. And to the Jews who the writer of Hebrews is talking to, that would have made sense. See? Because they had those scriptures all the way back from the time of Moses. Okay? So they had something to go by. And what the writer of Hebrews is talking about is exactly what Martin's talking about that because they could depend on the scriptures then, that now they could depend on this new covenant that had come through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Melchizedek, the representation. See, they could have understood that because Melchizedek was already addressed in the Old Testament to Abraham. See, to us, to Gentiles, it wouldn't have made much sense at the time, but to the Hebrews it did in that time because they knew about it. You see the difference? See, if, if the writer of Hebrews was going to the Gentiles and trying to address the message to them like he was addressing it here to the Jews, I hate to say it, they wouldn't have understood what he was talking about because they wouldn't have known the old time scriptures or anything. But yet Paul used the scriptures from the Old Testament to present the good news, right? And we saw that even with Philip when he showed up at with the, uh, the eunuch, you know, the the eunuch that was in his carriage, and he was reading Isaiah 53, as we know it today. And when Philip showed up, because the Holy Spirit sent him there, he was able to say, you don't understand what you're reading. And so he explained the good news to him from Isaiah 53. See, the Old Testament was all that was available back then. It, there wasn't a New Testament in the sense that we have it, but the gospel was already there. And so that was what was being proclaimed was the gospel. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's transferring the Old Testament concepts or the scripture contents as the Hebrews knew it into an understandable framework that they could see the new covenant carrying out. 
And that's what he's doing here, is he's making, trying to bring that correlation over so that those who are locked in the old covenant can see what God has done and move on into the new covenant with it. So that's what this is all being addressing to these Jews that the writer of Hebrews is talking to. But yet, look, at it, it helps us too, though, because now we can see what it is that Jesus did through the old, or I mean, God did through the old covenant into the new covenant through Jesus Christ, and what position Jesus is held throughout all of scripture as the son of God. And I mean, that brings a lot into clearer focus when you look at things like that. And that's why Hebrew sometimes can be a difficult letter to understand, because a lot of times we tend to want to read it as a Gentile, but you can't read it in that framework without understanding what the whole old covenant was about and how to bring that old covenant into the new covenant as God intended it through his, his wonderful presence and the way he carried this out. So any questions before we go into verse four? I would just say also that uh, it's a lesson for us to learn that the same way the, the author of Hebrew is, is bringing their the background, in, in order for us, let's say, if you're going to, to a mission trip and, you, and, and to a culture that you don't know, first you need to learn about that culture, right? And see Amen. what is that they believe. You, you could bring it up, you could bring the gospel and, and make a relationship. The same thing we meet someone on the street, you know, the different type of beliefs. That's why we need to be informed about things what's going on so you could bring the gospel to their level. Amen. Very well put, Mark. Because, I mean, we have I think we've messed that up in many occasions and some missionaries that have gone overseas trying to take Americanism into Christianity over there. And you can't do that. You know, as a matter of fact, it's offensive because people get are very tied to their cultures. And, and believe me, the word of God is so wonderful that it doesn't have to be presented in an American culture way only. I mean, actually, the Word of God is living and powerful, as we saw in Hebrews 4.12, right? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. If you understand the culture, you can understand how to present it in God's way through His Word to them that makes sense to them. And that's how they hear the Word of God. They hear it through their own culture and through their own medium, because God doesn't just do it in an American culture kind of way. He does it in a way to reach all people. He wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you don't want to alienate the people by insulting them, because we've, we've been guilty of that sometimes in a way we've gone and presented the gospel. But we need to bring it to them in a humble, loving way, which is what Peter talks about, right? We have to be able to defend what we know, but in a way of of joy, peace, love, care. It's, it's about showing Christ's love in the process. And that's what attracts people, is that God is love. Amen? Amen. Okay, verse four. Amen. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. So he's associating this person, this person, as, as Don had put it, this uh, manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ, he gave him a tenth. The sons of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. Now, this verse 5 jumps ahead a long way. When Abraham gave the tenth, there was no law yet, right? I mean, that had not come into play yet. It Is the beginning of that verse talking about Melchizedek? Okay. Now yeah, consider how great. We're still talking about Melchizedek here. Okay. Yeah. That was the plunder to him is Melchizedek there in verse four. Okay. So Abraham provided a tenth to Melchizedek. Think of it that way. But yet, look at this. Now, verse 5 is jumping all the way ahead to Moses. He's not talking about Melchizedek here directly. 
but indirectly, he's talking about what God had established as the priestly office through the Levites. So in other words, a representation of Melchizedek, he's saying, the sons of Levi who received the priestly office because God established the tribe of Levi as the ones that were going to maintain, manage, and uphold the, the concepts of God in the temple. Okay? So he says, the sons of Levi who received the priestly office have command according to the law to collect the tenth from the people. Now, this wasn't something that you know, came forward necessarily from what Abraham did to Melchizedek. This was part of what God had established for the people, okay? The tenth, the first fruits, you know what I'm talking about? The tenth part. These were the things that were given because God had set up the 12 tribes to have their own responsibilities, well, and ownership. Well, tri the tribe of Levi could not own anything their responsibility was to God to take care of the temple, to do what God had them do and represent God before the people. So because of that, they didn't have their own fields and farms and stuff to be able to take care of. So what God did is that he provided for them through the works of the other people, giving the best of the crop, the first 10%, the first fruit, giving a 10th of what they had. And when you actually look at it, they weren't just giving 10%. When you look at first fruits and the other things that God had established for them to give, they were given more than 10% if you were to cost it out, as it were. And it, but it wasn't about cost that God had intended. You know, a lot of times we get so focused on 10%. Okay, that's it, God. Sorry, I already hit my 10% limit this month. I can't give anymore. You know, baloney. You know, I mean, if God lays on your heart to do something and ends up being 30% and you can afford it, then you should do it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, God works in his way to bring honor and glory to his kingdom. And most of the time when we're giving that kind of money, it's because we're helping others out. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to love others. You know, how are we going to love our neighbors ourselves if we say, I don't want nothing to do with you? You know, so that's why, but the writer of Hebrews is bringing out that they had to collect the tenth from the people because that was what was established in the law. That is from their brothers and sisters. In other words, the other 11 tribes were providing this tenth so that Levi, the tribe of Levi, could be supported to carry out the ministry to God for the people. And so he says, though they have descended from Abraham. Okay, so they come from Abraham. That's where God set the Abrahamic covenant, and that's where the father of many nations and the fact that it was all this was going to come from him, that's where it was established through that one chosen son through Isaac, the son of promise. So they all descended from Abraham. That, notice that it, it's Abraham where the covenant starts that sets that trend because that's where the promise of God had come from. And he says, but one without this lineage collected, now he's talking about one, one, we're back to Melchizedek, one without this lineage. In other words, that manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. So in other words, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, you know, because of what he did, he blessed Abraham and it was right for him to have received that blessing because God had already given him a promise and that this promise was to be fulfilled. In other words, it was kind of like a progressive assurance to Abraham that things were still going to work out the way God had promised. Because remember, at the point where he saw Melchizedek, he hadn't had Isaac yet. Okay, Isaac wasn't born yet. So in other words, he's saying it's coming. It's still coming. I, God, show you that through Melchizedek, my priest, my high priest. You see the issue? So that way, Abraham understood that God was still active in carrying out what he promised he would do. So he says in chapter 7, without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. Now, who is the inferior? Satan. The Levite. Keep going. 
priests, the, uh, the earthy priests. No. In this case, he's talking about Abraham. So the inferior oh. is oh. Abraham, who is blessed by superior Melchizedek, and who is, you know, the high priest. So in other words, that's the inferior that is blessed by the superior. Yeah, I know that one can be a, a, a kind of like a, a head turner, huh? So anyway, so in verse eight, in the one case, men who will die receive a tenth. But in another case, scripture testifies that he lives. So now when he's talking about this, in the one case, men who die receive a tenth. Okay. Let me see here. Hang on just a second. Let me move up here to where I'm at. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, let's see here a sec. Uh, what in the world? I'm trying to find where I'm at here. I think that's a different chapter. Yeah, it is. Hang on. Oh. Yeah, it's six. Uh, okay. Hang on, I'm I'm losing myself here. It's called old age and senility. Okay, so I'll blame it on that for right now. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> Don't rock the boat. Amen. <laughs> Why are you scribbling it all over? It? I'm not doing that. I have no idea how that's happening. Oh, I, everybody else sees that too. It scared me a minute. I thought maybe somebody had hacked into my computer. Yeah. Oh, I was I thinking wondering. My granddaughter got yeah. in there. I was uh, wondering if you guys were seeing that. that yeah, we are seeing that. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, we're guys. It. Probably happened with your mouse or something. Well, I'm see, here's my mouse away. moving around. So, I mean, I'm not doing anything. I do you have it? Do you have it where other people can share their screen? I don't think so. Oh, that's odd. Yeah, it is. That's, uh, I don't see it anymore. No, right now, no. But I've seen it before, too. It happened. It's happened in previous lessons. It's happened before, yeah. And it will happen again. I guess so. <laughs> that's what Murphy says. If it will happen, it will happen. <laughs> Put your crayons back in your box. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay, I didn't know you guys could see that. Um, there's this little button where you can like, um, you you could like scribble on the screen, and I got kind of carried away with that. I didn't know you could actually see it. Oh, so that's you, Bobby. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I didn't know. I thought it, I thought only I could see that. <laughs> All well, the rest I guess of us not. too. Hey, you can know where it's coming well, from. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. I guess in a sense, maybe I do have some screen sharing thing on. I'd have to go through and look at that. <laughs> the the truth comes out. out. I thought it was aliens. <laughs> oh, Bobby's an alien. I'm gonna put my tinfoil hat on and and watch wait for aliens to come down. <laughs> oh my goodness! Put your crayons away, Bobby. I'm trying to find where I was. I'm pretty sure I was like right in this there's area. Seven, right there's there. seven right there. That's what I thought. In the one you were at there. seven verse seven. We went, I thought we were eight. Okay. Okay, so, maybe uh, up to eight now. Point. Yeah, yeah, we were up to eight. You're right. Eight. Yeah. Oh, we'll die for a tenth. But in another case, scripture testify that he lives. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, hang on. His name is Exodus. So anyway, uh, let's, let's keep going. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die receive a tenth. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I don't know who they're talking about that will die will receive a tenth. Anybody got a clue on that one? I would just say it's referring to the... Uh Basically, the, 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 the previous priests, because they die. 
Oh, the human priest. That's right. Yeah, it's not so Melchizedek it's, it's, it's who doesn't making, die. It's making a, a comparison, a contrast between the one that, you know, the priest, that's right. of course, they used to die, right? That's right. The one, that's that's, right. That's, the one that is, is appointed to Christ, uh, he, he lives. He's not going to die. Right. That's, that's right. why I'm taking that. You're right. Because, yeah, the in the Levitical priesthood, that high priest would die and somebody had to replace him. That's right. Okay. Good point. So, but in the other, Scripture testifies that he lived, whereas Jesus never dies. Okay, Scripture testified that he lives, that Jesus exactly. was raised from Whatever. the dead, and he is our eternal high, high uh, priest. High priest, yes. That's right. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I should have seen that. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, in other words, they received a tenth through the law, that he was a human priest, high priest, has paid a tenth through Abraham. In other words, it comes through the lineage, okay? In other words, it's, it's coming through the covenant that it's pointing forward to Christ. And for he will, within his ancestor, when Melchizedek, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So in other words, what he's saying is that there's a lineage all the way from Abraham up through Jesus. It's part of the prophetic matter of the fact that Jesus is the pointing forward to the high priest. And so through all these Levitical priests, it was a tie that not only went back to Melchizedek and Abraham, but goes all the way forward to where Jesus dies and is resurrected and sits with the, with the Father, being our intercessor, as Martin had indicated, and representing us as the most high priest. So that's what he's talking about here. And that's why there's a constant lineage. And that's the picture that the writer of Hebrews is painting, that the Hebrews needed to see that tie, how that tie played in, and that it didn't just stop uh, before when Jesus came. That it, it went in, but it tied into the Son of God that came into the world as the Messiah to die on the cross as it was, as it was prophesied and to be that high priest for us after his death and resurrection, because he paid the price that would cover all, or not cover, but forgive all those sins for those that came to him. So any questions about the greatness of Melchizedek and how Jesus fulfills that role and is carrying out that role as the most high priest for each and every one of us as he intercedes for us beside the Father? I would just say that uh, you know those all those false religion. Yeah. Uh, listen, when they pray, I'm sorry, God's not listening to them. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's there's no way unless you know God uh, they repent, but they just wasting their time. Because they are. God, God, God's not gonna uh, incline His ear to to sinner unless right. they come to repentance. We could come and in the name of Christ, a high priest, and Amen. we enter His presence. Yeah. And that's what Jesus has said, right? Anything you ask the Father in my name, you know, because he's the one that represents us in my name, you know, and he'll, that's what he's there for, is to represent us. So we do it to the Father in his name. We come boldly before the throne of God in Christ's name. We, we have everything available to us today. We need to keep our eyes on him. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's move on to verse 11 and see where we are here. He says, now, he's still talking about priesthood, because remember, this is a hang-up that many of the Jews would have gotten stuck with because they only understood the theological legal system to be based on this priesthood, and what the writer of Hebrews is trying to do is showing that that the old priesthood has been replaced by the new priesthood in Christ Jesus. And that there is a change, but they have to understand how that change has happened. He's already made the case, I think, from the Melchizedek point of view up to this point, but apparently, apparently these are gonna be some, there's gonna be some hard-headed people in the process that aren't just gonna summarily accept it, and they need more assurance. And so he pro progresses 
to show that Jesus is a superior priest to the Levitical priest that, that preceded him. And so that's where he goes now in verse 11. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. In other words, if it came through humans, and remember, the law came through Moses, a human being, and that was all that was needed, what further need was there for another priest to appear? If that was sufficient, why would God have done it any other way? Why would he have taken any other steps if that was all that was needed? Obviously, there was pro that was problematic. There were still issues that needed to be addressed, right? So he said, to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to that of Aaron. If, if the Aaronic priesthood was sufficient, why did he need a priest after the order of Melchizedek? And so what he's saying is, hey, come on. It was a looking forward, a type, as it were, of the priest that was to come, the most high priest through the order of Melchizedek, which was Jesus. And that's the point he's trying to make here, that this priesthood through man was not sufficient. It was acceptable to God for a period of time based on the fact that he established the law and put this into place. But it was not the end all catch all. God's plan was bigger than that. He had a better way because the priesthood was not perfect. As a matter of fact, as you read through the Old Testament, you find very little of the time did they ever stick to it. Most of the time they were away from it and they were coming back to it and they go away from it again. Then they come back and then, you know, as a matter of fact, they even lost the law. And it wasn't until they had gotten into fixing up the temple that somebody found the copy stuck in between some of the rocks back in Josiah's time frame. You know, I mean, so obviously they had got to the point where the law didn't really mean a whole lot to where they didn't even follow it. So he, what he's saying is that this had to change because that system was not, you know, not the end all catch all that was going to be the solution that God had implemented for all time. The solution he implemented was based after the order of the Aaronic priesthood, but it was going to carry a God level priesthood through the order of Melchizedek. For the, when there is a change of the priesthood, we talked about that, that every year, you know, a priest, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. If they were not found righteous, they, like uh, Martin said, they were gone. But when the priest died, when the high priest died, they had to, he had to be replaced by another high priest. Okay, it wasn't, you know, that was the way that continuance happened. And he said, for when there is a change of the priesthood, the human priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. Why do you think there had to be a change of law as well when there was a change of the priesthood? What, how would you derive that conundrum? Why did the law have to change? That's a tough question, right? Maybe the initial um, priest, things were written like in his name, like when there's the Pope and things are with the Pope and then we have a change in the Pope. Do they change some things like that or well, not? Good point. It's another name, right? It's another person that you're looking to as the high priest. You're not, although, and that person's a representation of God, right? Because remember, Phineas took over, right? And all of a sudden, now this is a different guy that's high priest as compared to the, his predecessor. So yeah, that's a good way. That's a good way of looking at it, Sally. Good point. And, uh, ahead, you know, the thing is, remember that the priest used to make sacrifice for himself. Here we have in Christ, uh, a perfect, uh, priest that he could, you know, it's God. That's Amen. The, Amen. Into the, he intercedes for us as a sinless, without sin. Amen. Not, not the other priest. Right. Exactly. And so what that shows, and it follows on to what Sally's saying. For the human ones that were changing, there, there wasn't really a change of the law in that sense that the law that God gave changed. But what Martin is saying is that 
the change that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here is from the human priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood, which takes it from the Old Testament covenant law to the new covenant law through Jesus Christ. That is the law that's changed. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He's talking about that when Jesus took over as the high priesthood, the law is Jesus now. All the law works through him, not the old covenant. That's why we don't have to follow all the law. If you go read Leviticus, we don't have to follow all those rules anymore. Those rules don't apply to us in that sense. Now, are there moral standards in there that do measure as to how well we're doing morally? Yes. How, don't the Ten Commandments tell us, hey, you, you shall have no other gods before you? Does that still apply? Yep. Yeah. Do you, are you supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Yes. Are we still, are we supposed to still lie, commit adultery, or be envious, or any of that? No. No. <laughs> no. So those still apply, but those don't determine whether we're going to heaven. Because uh, we live through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? And his commandments, he says, are not grievous. And also, when he was asked, what are, the, what are the most important commandments? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do those two things, you've already carried out all of the scriptures, all the law and the prophets, if you could do that. If we could love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. guess what? We have done everything God wants us to do to be his children. But the reality is, what's that? We fulfilled all the law right. and the promises. But the real, <laughs> but the sad thing is, can anybody truly do that in our own strength? Yeah. Only okay. through Christ alone. Only through Christ alone. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. I'll say we also made a transition or a change from imperfect priest to a perfect one. Amen. Good point. Amen. Yes, indeed. That is true too, because now. Jesus doesn't have to go, you know, purify himself all the time, right? Whereas the priest before had to. They had to continually do the ceremonial purity thing. What's that, Don? He never needed, he never needed to pure himself, purify himself because he was pure from Amen. the beginning. All the time. Amen. Perfect. And so... See the, see the transition? See, these are the transitions that the writer of Hebrews is trying to get over to the Jews. Because he's trying to say, look, you've got to change your way of thinking now. Because Jesus now is the one that carries all of what you know about the law and the prophets is now about the Son of God and what the Father has done through him. What Yahweh has done through his Son. And so... That's what he's trying to get them to understand here, that this is a, a, a more wonderful and a more perfect thing that has come. And you have to understand that it's all part of God's progressive plan for humankind to bring salvation to all humanity. And so he says, uh, for one thing, for the one thing, I'm sorry. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different uh, oh, man. I was, for when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of the law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. What tribe is he talking about? Judah. I think, I think he's talking about the Gentiles here, that God is opening up a bigger picture now, and God is opening it up to more than just the Jews. They've never served at the altar. No Gentile even knows about the scripture in that sense. You see what I'm saying? To where they've lived it, uh, except for maybe some sojourners that came and lived among the Jews and remember that the law said that a sojourner should be accepted, that if they came into the Jewish realm, that they should be able to be accepted if they follow all the rules and regulations, the laws and everything. So I think that's what he's talking about here, that they are the ones 
uh, that are to come into the tribe. They're, they're going to be part of the tribe, okay? It's kind of like, uh, you know, in John 10, when we talk about the good shepherd, and he said, and then there is another uh, people, basically, that uh, he's reaching out to. This other people, this other tribe, this other group, it are the Gentiles. And so he's saying that this is a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. None of, no Gentile was allowed to the altar. Only the Jews were allowed, and only the Levites were allowed at the salt altar, right? To, to basically serve for the Jews. And he says, now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. Okay, now, is he talking about Judah here? Yes. Talking about the, the, the Levites, isn't it? Yeah, because Levites. Uh-huh. Yeah, because what he's saying is, basically, the Moses never, never, never mentioned that uh, the high priest, in this case, Christ, was going to come out of, 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 uh, of Judah. Because That's right. you know that every, every priest has to come out of the, uh, from the Levites, right? Right, exactly. Well, so then if that's the, you know, being what Martin said, then let's re, let me reassess what I said up here, that the tribe that he's speaking about is Judah up here, not the Gentiles, right? See, he's saying for the, for the ones these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. In other words, they're talking about where the high priest, the, uh, the most high priest is to come from. So that's not a Gentile tribe. He's talking about yeah. a Judah yeah. tribe because Judah was not allowed to go and offer sacrifices either, were they? They had, they had to rely on the Levites to sacrifice anything that they brought in. So he says, no one from it has served at the altar because only the Levites, as Martin is saying, served at the altar. And he says, now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah. So they're saying, wait a minute. What's, what's wrong with this picture? Aren't, isn't the high priest supposed to be a Levite? But he's saying, no, he came from Judah, right? The lion of Judah, the lamb of God came from Judah. And he says, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. So what he's doing here is he's bringing out the argument that says, well, wait a minute. How, see, I, I, for him to bring out this argument, he's saying, I'm sure that there is some pushback saying, wait a minute. If this Jesus was the Messiah and he's going to be the high priest and he is the, uh, you know, after the order of Melchizedek, you've got it wrong, dude. It can't be him because this guy's from Judah, not from Levi. And so he's saying, how can this guy you're saying is the high priest coming from the wrong tribe? God appointed the Levites to be the ones that held the Levitical priesthood. So he's saying, there's something wrong with this picture. So he's trying to tell them, no, this is where it's going to come from. He says, and he says uh, in verse 16, and this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears. In other words, is there going to be another who did not become a priest based on the legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life? So in other words, he's saying, this, it, it's got to be understood where Melchizedek, in other words, this like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on the legal regulation. The legal regulation was that it had to come from the tribe of Levi about physical descent, in other words, a human being, right? But based on the power of an indestructible life, which is God. God is the only indestructible, right? He's forever and ever, amen. And so, for it has been testified, you are a priest uh, forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, as we look at this, what, what he's trying to show, he's building towards where Jesus came from and why he has the authority to accept that position of being after the order of Melchizedek, and that the fact that he is not of the Levitical priesthood line, but he comes from Judah, from the tribe of Judah. And that's why 
he's arguing or supporting his point up here. So he says, for the previous command is an old because it was weak and unprofitable. So what he's saying is that that whole lineage that said that it had to come from the order of Levi is now annulled. Because what? Humans were not capable of upholding that godly position, that godly uh, yeah, position of high priest in a perfect way. And so he's saying, for the law perfected nothing. And we saw that in the fact that they continued to sin. They continued to have their problems. They continued to go after other gods. They continued, even while they were 40 years in the desert, they still, you know, you would have thought that out there, there wasn't anything to go after. But guess what? They were. They were still going after other things, other gods. But he says, but a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So he's saying, look, Tell me that what we've had in place has worked. Tell me that that system of priesthood, the Levitical system of priesthood, has, has done everything God had intended it to do and that it has so transformed us to where we have no desire to follow any other God but God. And we keep his laws perfectly. And yeah, you can't find one error in our way of walking and everything we do brings honor and glory to God. And what he's saying, see, it didn't work for us the way it was supposed to. You know, there were people trying to keep the law at some level, but a lot of it became them trying to keep the law and they lost the whole focus on what it was about, which was loving God and that out of that love, obedience would be displayed. But instead, they tried to focus so much on keeping the law that they lost focus on who the lawgiver was and having that personal relationship with him. And so that's yes. where, yeah, go ahead, Mark. And yes, I guess to emphasize also that remember the sacrifice in the Old Testament used to only cover the sin. Right, right. You used to cover the sin. You used to sin again, do it again as a repetition. Where Christ came, he re he removed our sins. Amen. That's, that's, that's a big contract there. That's so yes, they kept on going sacrifice at the time because you used to cover only cover the sin. That's right. It was temporary. That's right. Yeah, because all of those sacrifices were a looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice. Not that they themselves. As a matter of fact, we'll read a little here and later in Hebrews where it says that. Could the blood of animals forgive sin? No way. They couldn't. It wasn't in that blood that forgiveness was there. But it was a representation, a looking forward, kind of like Donna uses, the picture of what was to come. You know, it's that kind of aspect in terms of what God's plan was for mankind. Not just for the Jews, but for mankind. But here, obviously, he's talking only to the Jews, or at least addressing the issue mainly to the Jews. So that's why he's saying, that's why it was weak and unprofitable. Because it just couldn't meet, you know, from a human standpoint, it couldn't do what it needed to do from a godly standpoint. Now, it was designed to bring them closer to God. But unfortunately... It didn't work for them. They still went their own way, didn't they? They still carried out their own desires. They still went against God. And uh, even while they went, even when they went into the land, you know, after Moses had died, Joshua took them into the land. Did they all of a sudden, did that new generation just totally follow Christ and say, or I mean, totally follow God and say, yeah, we finally got it figured out. Those people that were the naysayers are gone. We got it. And now everything's just going to work fine. And our relationship with God is just going to be perfect. <laughs> Wishful thinking, right? It didn't yep. work out. <laughs> and uh... that latter part of 19, is it referring to Jesus? A better hope is introduced. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For which yep. we draw near to God. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. No, we're just going to say that, you know, looking at this passage, and, and people, some, as, as you know, the seven Adventists, they still insist, or basically to the Old Testament, uh, the old rules of keeping the Sabbath. 
I mean, do, do they really read this Bible? Because it is clear. We have a new order according to the Melchizedek. Mar we don't have to follow all this uh, uh, ritual that, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the Jew you, I mean, used to do. As a matter of fact, look, I used to have a business in New York. <laughs> and across the street, it used to be a synagogue, right? Mm -hmm. And the rabbi came one day. I think it was, <laughs> it was on a Saturday. And he asked me to open the door or to open the door <laughs> and turn the light, light on for him because he couldn't do it. They're not allowed to, to do anything on Saturday. Right, exactly. So that, see, he made you sin so that he wouldn't have to sin then. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's so, it's, that's right, because I'm a Gentile, remember? Yeah, no, uh, I'm, exactly. a dog. I'm a dog. <laughs> we are dog for them. We don't count. Uh, it's, so, it's all about following rituals. It, it, and and it, that's, that's right. Yeah, and all, their, all these religions, as you know, that's all they do is to try to please God. By their rituals that they have. The same thing with the, uh, the Hindus and yep. and uh, yeah, all the Wiccans and so on and the Muslims. That's what they do. That's what they do. It's all about works. And Which see, it would be sad if everyone was Jews and we couldn't have any Gentiles to work for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just sad that you know humanity has their issues, you know, but God understood that, and I like what Don is saying. Yes. Um, in other words, the sacrifice only covered the sin, like sweeping it under the carpet. And Jesus came and lifted that carpet and swept all the sins away. Amen. You got that right, Donna. And so, I mean, when we look at what, I mean, it was a pointing forward. But see, what God had intended, the law was never intended become, to become ritualistic. That was never God's intent. But see, Man has this predilection that, hey, if you put laws before me, let me see how well I can keep them and how many I can keep. It's kind of like, let me, it's, if I can keep them, then I'm good. But see, what that does, though, is it makes you put your level of, what can I say, level of righteousness on the laws, not on your God. Because then it's about, okay, I kept that law, I kept that law. But then they become so distracting that you never think about who was the one that gave me the laws and who's the one that wants a relationship with me in the first place. Self and that's, yeah, go ahead. Self-righteousness. Exactly. Since and that's, Jesus. yeah, go ahead, Don, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just said self-righteousness instead of Jesus' righteousness. Amen. And isn't that what the Pharisee, Pharisee problem was that Jesus called them on the carpet for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. All the time. <laughs> exactly. And so, I mean, these are real things that are out there. And guess what? We today can become exactly like them if our focus isn't on Jesus and our relationship with him being the most important thing in our daily lives. Amen. And that's where we need to be careful because we can just turn into a Pharisee just as easily. And that's not what God wants. Above all, God wants a relationship with his people, a loving, caring, active relationship with us. That is more important than anything else out there. And that's and why that is so beautiful when you build it. Amen. You know, yes, and and I mean, look, I mean, there's so much burden if you try to live up to God's standards. None of us can. That's the reality of it. So why try? Instead, let's keep our eyes on the Lord and follow Him, and trust Him that He's going to do what He said He'll do, and in that we can have His peace that surpasses understanding. And that's more important. Yeah, did somebody have something? Okay, so when we look at that, we realize, okay, uh, like, like Victor had said in verse 19 here, it says, but a better hope is introduced. Notice it's hope, right? In other words, hope is something that you continually hold on to. Okay, hope isn't something that just comes and goes. Hope is something that you hold on to. For those that are in my Corinthians class, we just did 1 Corinthians 13, not this last time, but the time before. But look at the last 
three aspects of what 1 Corinthians 13 sums up with. And he says, and then there was faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, right? But look at, and there is faith, hope. Hope says that you continually hold on to it and you don't let go. It's that hope that holds you into your relationship with him, knowing that you're going to go be with him and that you're going to live with him forever and ever. And that that's an awesome and wonderful thing to go be with your savior, your maker, your Lord. And I mean, that's hope. Okay. And that through it, that's how we have that promise of security, not through what we've done, not through our works, yeah, do we have good works that God has prepared for us in accordance with Ephesians 2.10? Sure. But we don't do that because somehow we think we have to do it to benefit ourselves, to make us better, a better, have a better chance at getting into heaven. No. We do it because we already know we're secure in Christ Jesus and that our hope is secure in him and that because of that love that he has through us, the overflow has us do good works for others. Not, and it doesn't change our relationship with him or give us an idea that somehow we're going to be a better Christian because I've done all these good things. It has nothing to do with that. It's about being in Christ Jesus and staying in Christ Jesus until he calls us home in a loving, caring, mutual relationship with him. That's what's important. And so that's why he says that this better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. We draw near to God by building our relationship daily with Jesus Christ. Anything short of that starts making it about works or starts making it about what I can do to make myself more, uh, to be in a better position with Christ. Hey, Jesus already paid the price. You can't do anything that somehow is going to trump, oh, pardon that word, that is somehow going <laughs> to bypass what Jesus has done for us, okay? Because yeah. he's yeah. paid it all. Yeah. He paid yeah. the whole price, everything. Yeah, Ted? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, like, like they say, it's easy to, to keep the spirit of the law than to keep the law. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you know it's, it's easy to, 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 uh, to be re religious, because you know what, you could you could basically go <laughs> kill someone and pray three times a day, because it's just a routine. But let me tell you, if you if you if you have something with your brother, and you not come to turn with with uh, be, uh, with that person, you can't pray. You won't be able to pray. But it's easier to keep to keep the riches of the day and be religious. That you could do and hate and hate your brother. And that's what the Pharisees were doing, wasn't it? Were they because, going out yeah. killing people? No, well, in essence, they were. When they were stealing <laughs> from the widows and their properties and causing them to die, and then they were saying it was Corbin, that's what they were doing. And Jesus okay. called them on the carpet for that. Go ahead, Mark. Right, but, but, but you do have a religion, as you know, that's killing people. As a matter of fact, killing a lot of Christians. And they say they love God. So how can, in which, in which mind can you be killing another person and then go pray to Allah and say, hey, you know, I'm doing a good deed. That's of the devil, obviously. That's right. Amen. But that's human it's thinking. Religion. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that, Donna? I was just adding on to what Martin said. It's Satan's perfect religion. Now tell yes, you. indeed. Yes, indeed. Did you say Satan's yeah. perfect religion? Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's because Satan is the father of lies, and that's what he does. He brings out the lie anywhere he can. And, and that's what he uses as his main tool to mess with anybody, even Christians, is he brings out that lie. That's why we got to know his word. So that, you know, when Satan tries to come at us, we say, uh, 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 that's not what God says. God says in his word, so-and-so. And so you got no power there, Satan. So look at what he says here in verse 20. None of this happened without an oath. For others became priests without an oath. But he became a priest with an oath 
made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. See, and what he's talking about, he's going back to the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, and he's just saying, look, those people, just when one died, the other was appointed. It wasn't like they had to get up and put their, you know, do the old Boy Scout thing, you know. Uh, it, they just moved into the position based on their lineage, based on their genealogy that they were after the order of Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, that kind of thing. But what he's saying is that when Jesus came, God is the one that swore him in as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that was a God thing that put Jesus in place. So what he's saying to the Jews is, guys, that God instituted that, that, that the tribe of Levi would run the temple and oversee and carry out those, fulfill those duties. But that was one done item. But it was, as he said up here in verse 18, weak and unprofitable. Now, God has put the one into position that he intended, that was basically prophesied from of old in the Old Testament, and Jesus is that person. And that's where the writer of Hebrews is supporting that, okay? He's basically coming in through Psalm 110 here, and he's bringing that out. And he says, because of this oath, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant, the new covenant, the New Testament as we know it, the gospel, if you will. Jesus is it. Not, not anything else, not the old law, not anything else, but Jesus has become our salvation. He is the gospel. He is the good news. He says, for many have become Levitical priests, since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. Okay, they all died, right? So every time they died, they couldn't remain in office. But because he remains forever, Jesus is eternal, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them, right? So Jesus is the ultimate solution and God's great masterful plan. And I'll tell you what, praise God for it. So look, he says, verse 26, for this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Now, separated from sinners doesn't mean that he won't interact with sinners. What he's saying is that his, his perfection is separated from our cursed existence, okay? Even in Jesus's time on earth, he was still separated from sinners because he never sinned. See the issue? Is that the holiness because of his holiness? Oh, absolutely. It's his perfection because in it, remember, Jesus was tempted in every way that any human being is ever tempted, but it says he did not sin. So that's that separation between us and sinners. It's not a love, you know, it's not a hatred separation or anything. What he's saying is God was perfect, Jesus was perfect, and we are sinners. That's the separation. And God exalted him above the heavens, right? Isn't he the one that, that said, and this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? He is the one that the yes. father said, you, you carried out my plan and you are awesome, my son. And that's why, you know, he is exalted. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day. He already did it, right? As high priests do, first for their own sins. We talked about that, that, hey, the human priests have to cleanse themselves and get their own sins covered first before they could, you know, pray for the others, right? Then for, he says, first for their own sins, that's the high priest, then for those of the people. So they had a, a double whammy of trying to get sins forgiven or covered in that time, right? He said, he, but Jesus did this once for all time when he offered himself based on the Father's will, right? For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. In other words, are susceptible to sin. That's what he means by our weak, okay? But the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son 
who has been perfected forever. So in other words, Jesus is not weak. He is perfect. And because of that, we can rely on him that he is our perfect high priest that we can go to in any time of need. And we can come boldly before the throne because after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is the one ultimate high priest who has already done everything required to be able to meet the Father's need for the forgiveness of sin. And that is where our problem lies, is in sin. When sin is taken care of, we are righteous before the Father through Jesus Christ. Question. Amen. Comments? Yeah, go ahead, Victor. Here's oh, the perfect amen. lamb. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. I was going to say, he's the perfect lamb. He made the perfect sacrifice. He is our propitiation. And that's a done deal. There's nothing more he can do for us in terms of forgiveness of sin. He's already paid the price, total and complete, in accordance with the Father's requirement for justice, right? Amen, and amen. There is no other price that can be paid. There's nothing you or I can do to somehow mitigate our sinful condition. Jesus paid it all. He did amen. it all. And if amen. you try to think uh, that we can uh, do anything, you're, you're living a panacea because we can do nothing. Only what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Go so ahead, Mark. You are telling me those people in Mexico that uh, they, they get on their knees and, and they do all that. That's, that's, that's all in vain? <laughs> all in vain. That flagellation where they whip themselves and yeah, all in vain. And, and, and you know, basically what they're saying is this. The sacrifice was not sufficient. I got to right. do more. Uh, well, as mm -hmm. later, I think the uh, Hebrew writer of Hebrews says, and they crucify Christ again. Every time they do that, they're basically saying, oh, Christ didn't die enough. He's got to die some more. Here, let's put him back on the cross again. Isn't that a human way of thinking? Yeah, they always want to do We always, we always, I'm human, I guess. Yeah, isn't <laughs> that <always> crazy? <laughs> but you know, when he was on the cross, they basically, the word that he used was testile tie or something like that. Oh, to tell us, to tell Yeah, Donna yeah, knows that word. Which means it is pay in full. Price is paid in full. Amen. Amen. And nothing we can do, uh, like Donna put in their texting, faith alone in Christ alone. It's all paid. All we yes, have to do yes, is just say, I receive it. Yes, indeed. And that's it. Nothing more. It is paid. And that's the beauty. And that, see, now, you would say, well, why is this writer of Hebrews, you know, making such a point of this? Well, the reason is, is because, man, there were a lot of hard-nosed Jews that, I mean, trying to break them away from the old law way of thinking was not easy. You know, they got so locked and set in their ways for so many generations that for them to accept that, hey, God had always had this better plan, and that actually... Everything was a lot easier through Jesus Christ. They just couldn't see it. They were so locked in their way of works and trying to be good that they couldn't understand that Christ could do it all for them. And that's what this writer of Hebrews is trying to bring them over into is to understand that God had a better plan. And guess what? It is so much easier and it's so much more loving and it's so much better. So come on come on over but isn't that the human way we are reluctant if it looks too easy don't we always say oh uh, you know if it's if it's free there's always something to pay you know it's like oh, there, it's always a catch yeah exactly it's like there's always a catch behind it and i'm sure there's a catch here and nothing's, so he, what's that yeah nothing's exactly free. nothing's for free and you know I, Believe me, that is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get across to these people. Yes, it is. It is free, and it's wonderful, and it's awesome. And look, we don't have to go back through all this stuff. We can do it right now, straight up. And, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's, oh man, Jesus I plus could, nothing, as Donna says. Amen. I could Amen. probably see, like you said, that, Ted, uh, you know, the, uh, the Hebrew, 
they were probably uh, bringing their arguments with the with the author, say, "Oh, how, how, how can we don't have to do all this all the uh, all this ritual that we used to do? Uh, do we have to do this? Do we have to sacrifice?" And he said, "No, you have a new aura now. I'm the aura of oh my kiss You don't Amen. have to do it. It's all done. Amen. It's all paid for." <laughs> but I understand they would sew bells on the priest's uh, coat and they would wrap a rope around their ankle in case God did strike them dead, then they could pull them out and they put the bells on their clothes so if their bell stopped ringing, they knew that the guy had died. <laughs> That's right. That's... The Jews, do, they, do they still do that? No, <laughs> they have no temple anymore. So they don't do it ever since uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus. They've never built another temple. So they don't follow that ritual anymore. Now they're expecting that they will build the temple again. And as you know, prophecy says that when the seven year tribulation comes, that a temple will be rebuilt by, I guess the antichrist or whatever, to try to get peace with the Jews. And then they'll reinstitute a level of a sacrifice. And then if you remember, it says then that the antichrist later will defile the temple again. Like he'll take a pig in or something like that and, and, and do a defiling like happened before. So though that's to come, but it's possible that in that time frame they may actually try to do that. But see, the thing is, there's no Ark of the Covenant anymore to put behind the veil. Oh. So that was always what was in the Holy of Holies was the fact that God lived in between the cherubim at the top of that, you know, Ark of the Covenant. So I don't know how they're going to manufacture that, but there is no God in the Holy of Holies in any fabricated temple today because Jesus already died on the cross and the, that veil was rent, you know? So God is with his people. So I don't know how that's all supposed to happen. I just know that at some level it is gonna happen. But for right now, no, there is no temple for the Jews to go into the Holy of Holies. So no, they don't have any more bells in there. That's not one is gonna take place. What's that? I say God and his and his uh, providence knows when exactly it's going to take place. Amen. Amen. It's, well, I it's, think that's awesome that the the veil tore when Jesus died as a symbol that now we can go to God. We don't need the priest. Yeah, we don't need an Ark of the Covenant to go to. He dwells in us now. His Holy Spirit now dwells in us. We are his temple. And that is what's awesome, you know? Man, that sounds like a big responsibility. Oh, it is. In, in that sense, it is. Because, I mean, we're his temple. Are we keeping it holy? You know? I like what Donna says here. If I gave you a gift and you gave me one penny, it's not free anymore, is it? Nope. They will be using the Talmud and practicing Kabbalah, a.k.a. Antichrist. Yeah, back at the end yeah when they refabricate the temple and all that so yeah it's not a godly thing that they're doing at the end sadly you know they're because their position i mean god's position hasn't changed there still will have only be salvation through jesus christ not anybody else yeah even in the end times even in those end times i mean there will only be salvation through jesus i had a thought today yeah victor in our time it's well, one of these countries overtook Israel and it was no more like it is. What would God do? I don't think that'll happen. I still think God actually protects Israel. Um, I, they still are. I mean, even though God has opened up salvation to all mankind, he has not relinquished his covenant with Abraham. That Abrahamic covenant is still in effect with the jews at the end we see that you know god is going to rescue them even at the end during the great tribulation so i don't think anybody that tries to come against the jews will succeed even if we the americans break our ties with them and don't support them which i hope doesn't happen 
But if it, if it were to happen, I still think that no matter what, God will protect the Jews. God will raise another country. That, exactly. If, if it's needed, I think God can still even work miracles to protect them today like he did back then. Well, he will take care of himself. Uh, there you go. Um, so, I mean, it, they're not dependent on us. You know, I, I mean, I, I would rue the day that we were to break ties with them because then we would be, I think we're, we're given a lot more grace than we deserve because of the fact that we are in relationship with them. And I think though, that if we were to break that relationship, I think we would see some pretty bad stuff happen to our nation. A lot worse than what we had. The only way that would happen if we turned into a socialist country. Yeah, I don't know. We were pretty close to doing it in the last presidency. So you almost, you almost there. No. <laughs> so I want to make comments about the uh, the situation about young people. Young people. Uh, you know how we how we losing uh, this young generation that go to college because, right. as you know, I think our churches are doing a very poor job. Uh, the, the the young kids are being entertained. Right. They not they not being taught the word of God. Right. You know, uh, there is a book out there by Lee Strobel called, the, as you know, the Case for Christ. Yeah, I like that book. Very good. That's book. an excellent uh, book. Yeah. And you know, you got Robbie Zachariah who wrote plenty of books because most of the young people are not being challenged. I remember when I was in True. college, the professor said, you know, re religion is for weak-minded people. People are looking for a, for an escape. Yeah, that's what they tell you. That's Basically, it's these young people. They not they, if they're not strong in their faith. Of course, they're going to be they're going to be deceived and they're going to be drawn away from their faith, which, which is sad. But it's, it's happening because the left is controlling the college and and, and public school. They're in control right now. True. You know, True. I mean, how many Christian people you're going to, going to find in, in public school or in college? Not too many. Not many. You're right. And I know Aaron's concerned about that with one of his daughters you know, being up there in school. Long well, Indiana is a very conservative I... state, which is a good thing. Well, but that, still, that the people that are, the new people that are running this school, I just saw uh, one of their little ad or banners on an email and they were uh, supporting Black Lives Matter on it. Oh, man. About had a heart attack. No kidding. No kidding. I said, no way, no. Yeah, yeah. sadly. Yeah. Martin, what was the book that you recommended for kids? Or, uh, it's, it's, it's by Lee Strobel. It's called The Case for Christ. But he has more than one book. But oh, you know, yeah. the, uh, we took that class in, in our church. Uh, Lee Strobel is S-T-R-O-B-E-L. Mm -hmm. It's called the case, the case for Christ, and uh, Ravi Zachariah has, you know, plenty of very books. good and books. You, yeah, and you could look at his, his YouTube uh, presentation. I mean, that's why that was his ministry to go uh, university in different college and to uh, have a discussion with, with students. That's and right. Let me tell you, the guy was very sharp. He is. He is awesome. He's amazing. And, and that, that's what young people need to do. They need to be. They need to be challenged. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, if you go to college and this happened, how are you how are you gonna uh, address the situation? True, true. I, I saw an interesting meme. It may not have anything to do with what we're talking about, but I was reading it when they were talking about education. This one uh, email that I got, and uh, the meme that was, I guess that's what you call it. I don't know what you call these things, these pictures with uh, sayings and stuff. It said, "Teach your children to follow Christ before the world teaches them not to." I'll tell you, I'll tell you, the, the world is a strong place. And if, if they aren't, you know, given the right tools, the world will take them. Yeah, Antifa or whoever is going to go out, is going to go after them big time. Yeah, I'm telling them you. And, and again, the problem is in our churches, they not, they, they're not teaching the word of God. It's, to, it's not the way they should. Inter entertain. It's music, jumping. It's not going to work. It's the word of God that transforms people. Well, something yep. I'm very proud of about Corey is because we homeschooled Bobby mm -hmm. and we've always homeschooled him since day one. And I knew before I even ever really wanted children that I, that if I ever did have children that I would, I would definitely homeschool them. But uh, Corey, for a while there, we were getting into the books that we were allowed to supply our own books. And for a while there, we were getting into the books of the science and everything. And it was fine. Everything was fine with all the workbooks and everything until he got into about sixth grade. And then they started teaching about, um, what do they call that? Uh, which one is it? Uh, hmm. 
when they teach you that you know you were made from a cell or, or oh monkey. evolution yeah evolution, yeah, evolution theory yeah 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 they in the sixth grade they got into that and that's when Corey said no no more no more and he started ordering his uh all of bobby's science books from creationism i think that that's the correct one right creation yeah okay so i get mixed up on the words um yeah so he started ordering all his science books for creationism and he's been teaching them about that ever since so i'm very proud of Corey for that awesome that. awesome yeah, it's, 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 right, right. I was doing all the work and and then like, you know, once I started telling them about what they're saying, what I have to teach them and their stuff or what, are, what the books you're teaching them, he says, no, no, we're not going to do that. And, you know, that's where it ends with regular books and we go to creation. He ordered them from a Christianity uh, uh, nationwide thing, emails, um, email um, website. Right. Okay. But uh, crazy work. But before you go, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, thing. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> you know, I I listened to Albert Muller. He's the president of uh Baptist College in in Georgia. Mm -hmm. and, you know this. Uh, it's like uh twenty minutes uh news from a Christian perspective. And uh, uh was it uh, Friday, right? <laughs> he said there's a there's a a Baptist pastor, right, who moved from here to Canada, and during this time of pandemic. He revealed himself. He's a liberal pastor. Now, you know, mm -hmm. that he said that God called him at that when he was 11 years old. But now, you know, now he's a chief. You know, now, <laughs> now he revealed himself. This guy, this guy already, he was married. He had, he has children, two children. But now he, he is a chief. And this guy's a pastor. Okay. <laughs> that's what we're going today. Yeah, that's, and I'll tell you, it's becoming more prolific, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing it out there. Like, it's, oh, just accept it. It's fine. No problem. You know? Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's I mean, okay. I mean, a pastor, a pastor who's, who's passing a church, and then and then he's going he's gonna to reveal to this congregation now that I guess he wasn't happy being a man. Now, I guess it's going to be true happiness now as being, uh, I don't know, whatever you call it. <laughs> a transgender. <laughs> I heard or read something about one time that what they're doing is like with the children that are like three and four and just go come out and say, I don't want to be a boy anymore or whatever, or I'm a girl and they really were born a male, you know, or stuff. I, there, a lot of them are like telling the, they're, they're coaxing the parents into this. They're telling the parents when the parents take their children to be evaluated or whatever, they're telling the parents, look, you know, if you don't accept this and, and embrace this new thing, this new national, uh, nationality, uh, what am I saying? Um, I'm sorry, I'm bad with words today. Uh, if you don't embrace this new uh, way of thinking or a new way of transgender, whatever, your mm -hmm. children will end up committing suicide and it'll be all your fault, you know? And it's like, you can't do that to a parent. They know exactly what to say. They know exactly what to do, you know, to, to coax these parents into accepting it. And, and I just think it's a really horrible thing because it's like nobody ever wants to think that they would be, they want to be responsible for somebody else committing suicide, much less their children. And, you know, and and they they just play on all these things, and just so the parents will accept it, so that they'll spend the money for the child to have any kind of uh, sex change or whatever operations that they're going to want or need or whatever they want to be associated with. And I think it's very very sad, very very cruel and mean to do that to parents, because especially you know if they don't, you know, they just play on those. Emotions. Yep. Yeah, emotions. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. I can't think of the word today. I'm sorry, folks. Right. No, <laughs> I can't remember anything that's, today. That's the world we live in today. And it's, hey, believe me, folks, it's not going to get more conservative. If anything, it gets more liberal. That's what the Bible says that's going to happen, you know. So don't be surprised. You know, these are just real things that are happening out there. And uh, that's why we need to keep our eyes on the Lord more and more and get closer to him because, you know, we still have to be able to show Christ's love in the midst of all this craziness. And that's what he calls us to. So let's we not have, lose have, focus on that. Yeah, Mark. We have to, we have to pray by the same time. That I believe we also have to defend our faith. We Amen. have to say, this, this is, this is our, my belief. So you, you are fine to believe whatever you want. But my family, we stick to our belief. And we yeah. got to stick to that. 
But some people say, okay, but uh, oh, that's not being loving. You know what? That's, I'm sorry. That's that's baloney. <laughs> no, you got to you got to stick to your belief. Right. So that's the problem. They, okay, they could express their belief by saying we got to stay quiet. It doesn't work that way. No, no. No, we, we actively, you know, engage, but in Christ's love, you know, we say we don't agree with that because Amen. the Bible Amen. doesn't yes. say that no. that's yes. what he wants. Exactly. Because it, it's a doctrine to that. I mean, imagine when you were young, I would say five years old, someone say, you know what? Do you know you could, I mean, I say I'm a male. Do you know you could try to be a female? Do you know you could have a, you could have a, 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 a boyfriend? So you already basically... Uh, pull her in this child mind, and that's yep. basically what's going on in school. Oh, if you're not happy about being a your girl, do you know you could, you maybe, you might be happy being a your boy. Yeah, that's. And she's gonna say, oh, not I me. read. Uh, they tell me in school that could be a your... I read an article where they were saying actually what is uh, usually happening in the situations is like the boy, little boy that's younger than the girl, little girl will have a problem. Like I read some, some people's personal, you know, stories or whatever that their children, the, the girl was older and she got, the, she got taken care of. They, they took care of her and they gave her, you know, nice gifts and stuff, but they weren't, they weren't so nice to the boy because the boy was always getting into trouble. So it's like when Santa Claus would come, which I never followed with Bobby ever from the beginning. And I don't condemn anybody who does, but you know, that's your choice, but I just didn't choose to do that. But anyway, when Santa Claus would come because the boy was getting into so much trouble constantly, the girl would get all these gifts and the boy would get gifts, but he would just get less gifts because I guess that the parents were like choosing to give her more gifts because she was, you know, a good child. And, and the little boy, I mean, all children are good, but, you know, he wasn't following up in that he was doing the wrong things and getting in trouble a lot. So then the boy started seeing that the girl was being rewarded more. They would reward the girl when she did good things, I guess, kind, to kind of uh, make the boy want to be good. I don't know what the word is. I can't think of the words today. Like I said, entice the boy to be good or something or, or make him see that, you know, if you're good, you'll get more reward. And so he, so he wanted more attention and everything. And so he just started saying that he wanted to be a girl. And the parents never picked up on this. I mean, the boy said this story, like when he grew up and stuff, he explained how it all got started. But he said it started, he started saying that he wanted to be a girl. And then he started getting a lot of attention. He started going, people started paying attention to him. And, and every, the parents were paying more attention to him because they were more worried about him and everything. They were taking him to evaluators and psychiatrists and stuff and everything. So he got more attention. So he knew that as long as he said he wanted to be a girl, he got more attention than the girl did it was getting because of it. I don't know what this is. This is boys from. That's human. That's human weaknesses. Yeah, well, but I mean, but then there were other situations too, and I can't remember them all word for word, but you get the point. It was always yeah. like something where the boy would have benefited or somehow by saying that he wanted to be a girl, or the girl would have benefited by another situation where the boy was, you know, more superior, where she was getting more attention as saying she wanted to be a boy. I'm yeah, just saying, this is just some yeah. of the things, and it's like, so it's not always, I don't believe that, you know, you can be born a boy and really be a girl. I mean, of course not, because I mean, God doesn't make mistakes, but you know. No, that's this, our this culture. Is some that's of the stories culture. of Sad people much. that said that they wanted, how, how their story ruled out the thing that, you know, they really didn't want to be a girl or a boy. They just wanted the attention. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and change over now, because man, this is a topic that could go on for hours. Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> We are, uh, no, that's fine. I know, we I we get covered that enough for tonight. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, anybody have prayer requests that they want me to cover tonight? We'll I pick up in a... chapter eight next week, by the way. Okay, go ahead, Mil Misty. I don't have a prayer request. I have a prayer victory. Good. I just have something I wanted to share with you guys that happened that I feel that God wants me to share with you. Uh, uh, Bobby was... Uh, uh, because of the pandemic, Bobby hasn't been able to see his asthma doctor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because, I mean, so they're going to do a video uh, uh, visit with him on Monday. And uh, he 
because I tried to call them. I had the appointment, but he ran out of his medicine early. So I was calling them to tell them if they could just, you know, write me enough medication to get him through until the time when he could make the visit and then he could get new prescriptions. And they said they couldn't do that because it was after three months. And uh, after three months, they're not allowed to send, write prescriptions even for anything because that's their policy. So I said, okay, well, I guess I understand. You know, I don't know what to do, but, you know, I guess I understand. So they, they, so that one night he went without the medication, and it's a medication that helps him breathe while he's sleeping. And he didn't have that medication that night, but the next morning I got a text message saying to come pick up his prescription. Praise the Lord. And the doctor had not called me, but I had called Gail. Oh, I'm sorry, I left out. I had called Gail and Doug, not knowing who to call first. I called Gail and Doug and asked them to pray for it, pray about it, everything. And because I was so worried, and I, you know, I suffer from anxiety, so you know that. And so I was in a, I was a mess. And the next day, I was at the pharmacy picking up my phar my medication, and I got a, a, a text message saying that to pick up his medication, it had been called in, and I went, I called them and they said, oh yeah, he has to pick up his uh, asthma medication. And I'm like, nobody, what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. In other words, I couldn't figure out, they said we had one last refill, and I knew we had no refills, because I'd seen the bottle that night, looking at the bottle, just hoping that there was a refill left, and I, there's no refills. So <laughs> I thought, Oh my goodness. And I called Gail and Doug and they were so happy. And they said they were going to call you too, Tim, but, and tell they you did. about it. Tell they you did. Happened. Well, actually, yeah. they told us about it on our class Wednesday. And, uh, oh, they so, did? Yeah. They so didn't we, tell me that. They told me they were going to call you, but they told me they never. Oh, they didn't tell me they talked about it on Wednesday. I'm yep. sorry. And so we <laughs> praised the Lord then too. Yeah. Well, yeah. So okay. that's awesome. That's know. awesome. Praise God. That's awesome. I just wanted to say, I know you were really tired last Wednesday and you taught us anyway, Ted. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Praise the Lord for that. He gives me energy, right? <laughs> Amen. Oh, that coffee Amen. works. Yeah, that's <laughs> good point. Good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Mark. I just want to thank God that tomorrow I turn 57. I'm almost Oh, there. happy birthday, Martin. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> hey, that is awesome. Get in there. I'm yeah. following you. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you got a little ways to catch up yet. <laughs> I'm behind you. <laughs> <laughs> not by much, not by much, but that's all right. Next month, I'm coming up on 78. Is that's that you? You're still a baby. Oh, Victor, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, then let's pray. Yeah, God is good. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for how wonderful you are and that you give us opportunity to come together. Even though we can't be together in person, at least we have a means to be able to come together and glorify you, to study your word, and to raise you up. And we thank you for that, Lord. We, we praise you, we honor you, and we glorify you. Now, Lord, I wanted to bring a few things before the throne boldly, as you've asked us to do. I first want to bring up my sister, Sherry, Lord, who wasn't able to be here with us tonight, that you would be with her. I know she's dealing with some depression issues and family issues. Nothing's hidden from you. And I ask that you would just put your hand on her and give her peace, Lord, and give her strength to be able to endure. Let her know that you are near. I mean, she tends to say she knows it, but when she addresses her concerns, it seems like she doesn't really know it. So please, Lord, reveal yourself to her in a way that she knows that you're always there with her and that she doesn't have to look to others to satisfy some of her longings and needs, but that you are there to fulfill each and every one of those. And that if there is a need, you will provide her the right person at the right time to be able to be there to help her through whatever situation is needed because she is your child. And Lord, I pray for her, her daughter, Alyssa, and also for her daughter, Amber. I know that, you know, those are two that have been causing some consternation and her, you know, concerns lately. 
So Lord, just help those relationships to get established in a way that can be peaceful to her and also be healthy relationship wise. I also, Lord, want to thank you on her behalf. She got her roof uh, put on yesterday or day before yesterday and everything went well. You kept the rain away. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, that you so wonderfully manifested yourself. I also want to praise you, Lord, like for what Misty brought up in terms of providing the medications for Bobby that he needed, even when it looked like he may have to do without you magic, well, not magically, but you wonderfully, you know, were able to bring about the fact that the doctor realized that he couldn't be there for an in-person visitation and renewed that prescription and they have the medications to be able to meet Bobby's uh, asthmatic need while he sleeps. We thank you, Lord, that, man, even when things look like they just fall short for us, you're always there and able to meet our need in and through it all, Lord. I also pray for um, Aaron's daughter up in, up in Indiana, Lord, that you would continue to be with her and that you would give her strength to be able to endure and also stand up for what she believes, Lord, in you, in you, and that you would help her, Lord, be strong in that. Reveal yourself to her in a special way, and that she knows that you're always near, and that she can share that with others, too, Lord. Now, Lord, as we go our ways today, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us. I pray that you would help in our relationships with our families, that you would help us to be the right kind of witness and reflect you in the right kind of loving way that brings you honor and glory. And I ask too that you meet our needs as, as are necessary. Help us to have peace too in this kind of new normal that's out there, uh, that we keep our eyes on you and be at peace even though we may have to be locked away for a period of time or whatever. And also keep us safe from the, the problem of the pandemic that's going on out there. So we look to you and praise you and know that you're always near and we look to you because you're always our stay and our hope in all things. And we love you for that, Lord, and we honor and glorify you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 All right, everybody. Thank right. you. This is a good class. I really. Nice yeah. weekend. What's that, Martin? Have a blessed weekend, and, blessed and, Sunday. And you have a blessed, happy birthday tomorrow, my brother. Thank you, yep. thank happy you. Birthday. Hey, yeah. birthday. Happy birthday to our birthday people. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Praise the thank Lord. You, Aaron. Where's Gail and our cakes? Yeah, I think Gail and Doug missed out tonight. Lord, be with them, whatever their situation is. I pray that all is well with them, Lord. Yeah, because they're very faithful. So I, they didn't tell me. I don't remember them telling me they were going to miss tonight. So I pray everything's well with them. Amen. Okay, everybody. Well, then, all good right. night. And God Thanks, bless you Dad. all. Hey, you're Thank welcome, you. Victor. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, Praise the Lord. Bye. Yeah. All have a good weekend, too. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God. Okay. Well, good night, Margaret. You take care, young lady. God okay. bless you. See you on Wednesday. You got it, my sister. God bless you. And Don, I know you, you're driving, so God bless you, my sister. You take care. Um, talk to you later. And, and Misty, you take care too, my sister. God bless you. You too. Yeah. Give my love to Corey and Bobby. I'll talk to them later too. Okay. I don't know whether they took off. Bobby had the screen, so that's why I didn't know about the scribbling thing until I until it was too late. I'm hey, like, what did you do? And I had like, no oh, idea where it was coming from. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know he was doing it. But we're doing it on Corey's phone, and Bobby was holding the phone the whole time. We were all listening, uh -huh. and I didn't even realize Bobby was doing that. And so, like when you said this, somebody scribbling, I was like, oh, who would do that? And I looked, and Bobby's looking at me real guilty. So. <laughs> it's <laughs> fine well at least now we know at least now we know i didn't know about it i would have stopped it it's <laughs> fine it's fine well at least we got entertained for a while <laughs> <laughs> well good night misty god bless you my sister good night you too good night. okay and good night margaret i'll talk to you later wednesday my sister okay good night bye-bye